Hello all you haymakers and hamburgers, coffee on a Tuesday and vlog 58. With few exceptions, I don't really read much contemporary fiction. It's been that way for a while now. If you take a look at my bookshelf, what you'll find is a collection of almost exclusively classic authors. Like Henry James, Proust, Hugo, Camus, Nabokov, Steinbeck, Balzac, and of course, Shakespeare. Now, there's an irony to this because many of these books were assigned to me as part of my secondary school curriculum, but in almost every case, what I read looked more like this than this. God, how many windows do I have over there? In one sense, I'm glad these books were assigned to us because now, when I actually want to read them, I know exactly where to look. Actually, I sometimes suspect that that's the reason why they assigned them to us in the first place, to map the intellectual geography of what is important and lasting in literature. I mean, what other reason could there be? I remember rereading Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter a few years back and thinking, whoever gave this to me when I was 15 must have been insane to think I had the mental acuity to process one of, if not the premier novel in American literature. At that age, I barely had the mental acuity to process The Matrix. Dualities, modalities, realities, dreams, uh, will, um... Destiny. Now, I use the word classic in a pretty broad sense. For me, it can mean anything from Homer and Shakespeare to Kerouac and Philip K. Dick. Essentially, I'm using as my measure a kind of collective academic agreement about what is great, what is influential or prescient or complex, really whatever Penguin has made a version of. But perhaps I'm wrong to let Penguin be the arbiter of what is and isn't a classic. Seeking a more precise definition, I've turned to the great T.S. Eliot, who in his essay, What is a Classic, contends that there are actually no classics in all of English literature, even such greats as Milton and Shakespeare, to whom there are perhaps no superiors in style and maturity, failed to achieve classical status because the language itself had not yet reached mature. A common style, writes Eliot, is one which makes us exclaim not, this is a man of genius using the language, but this realizes the genius of the language. We do not say this when reading Shakespeare or Milton because we are always conscious of the greatness of the man and the miracles that he is performing with the language. Indeed, Eliot holds that a universal classic comes at the confluence of a maturity of mind, manners, and common style. That Elizabethan poetry, as I've said before, is more invented by Shakespeare than fully realized by him, that the manners of the period were more provincial than universal. Eliot points to Virgil's Aeneid as the quintessential classic, and to Latin as the quintessentially classical language, for it consolidates the greatness of a mature predecessor, Greek, and is the common ancestor to which all of the European languages are heir. It is by the standard of Virgil and Latin that all modern works are judged, and it is a necessary standard for English literature to excel and not be consumed by chaos while being perhaps impossible for it to achieve, though we must soldier on imagining that we can. not It's the idea of a common style that interests me most. Common style is something that marks a classical period, whether in Eliot's larger sense or in a lowercase sense, so to speak, of classics within English poetry and prose. It doesn't mean, as Eliot says, that the best writers of such a period are indistinguishable, but rather that their differences are more subtle and refined, like the shades of taste between superlative wines. And it is also a mark of a classical period that the era before it is branded with eccentricity, as writers stab in the dark towards something not yet universal, and eccentricity too as the classical period passes away and originality becomes more valued than correctness. I don't know what period we find ourselves in today, but eccentricity, a kind of agitated free-for-all, seems to describe it. This, of course, reflects the culture at large. Not that we are devoid of great authors, but rather of great movements, of a common style. And every time I sit down to write, I find it impossible not to aim at classic. Now, maybe this suggests a hubris in me, or maybe the fact that I'm self-conscious about it suggests a deficiency in the period. As a writer and reader in 2013, I engage in no revolt against the current state of English literature. It's too heterogeneous now, even for that. I only wish to navigate that old and shamefully passé river, which from the mountain of Homer passes through all my heroes and me to I know not where.
Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Tumblr. Links in the description. Also, thank you to Nutty Nathan and all you guys who supported the Tuesday thing. We're keeping it, and I'm glad you're with me. I'll see you guys next time.